Hello and welcome to Broccoli News Extra, the programme where you get the chance to hear all you need to know about what's happening in and around the hospital, as well as updates on other local events and people who work in the community. I'm Alan Joyce and coming up today, we'll be listening back to the highlights from this year's Buttercup Walk, an annual event which takes place in the hospital to raise funds for the RNOH. Well, we'll be hearing from some of the participants and organisers, as well as from some of the stall holders. We'll also be hearing from the fire brigade who attended the event, as well as the hospital's chairman, Tony Goldstone. We'll also be hearing from this year's very special guest, the gold medal winning gymnast Max Whitlock. So let's join our team of reporters now, Marge Walker, Alice Glossop and Emma Nuriel, and we'll start with an interview with Emma with the Air Cadets. Hello, I'm here with the, uh, the great Air Cadets. Um, hello, I'm Flight Soldier Rahim. I'm Flight Officer Fernandez. I'm Corporal Abbasi. Fantastic, and whereabouts are you based? Um, we are 120 Hendon Squadron. And then um, what connects you here with the RNOH today? Well, we're here for two reasons. One of the reasons is to help promote the Air Cadets as an organisation. And the other reason is to help raise money um, for this organisation here today. And um, can you tell us a little bit about what the Air Cadets do? Uh, yeah, we do, we do a lot of activities. We do flying, gliding, shooting. Uh, we do some archery as well, drill, ceremonial stuff. Loads of sports activities. We do the DOV first aid qualifications. It's a lot of fun things that we do at the ATC. And um, if you want to become an air cadet, what do you need to do? Um, well, you, we have a minimum age of 13 years of age. So um, boys and girls are welcome. Just have to be 13 years old, and all you have to do is come down to visit our squadron, and we'll take it from there. Hello, uh, I'm sitting here with Penny from Pets as Therapy. Uh, she's here with a very gorgeous greyhound. Uh, this is Gracie, isn't it? Yes, that's right. She's absolutely gorgeous. Um, could you tell me a little bit about Pets as Therapy? Yeah, Pets as Therapy is a national charity, initially started by um, a charity called Pro Dogs. And we go into hospitals and old people's homes and schools across the UK with dogs of all, all breeds, cats, even bunny rabbits because it's clinically proven that stroking an animal lowers your blood pressure and raises your natural um, painkillers in your body. So I come in once a week with my husband because I use a wheelchair myself and that slope is a bit of a so-and-so when you can't walk very far. And we visit up to eight boards in the hospital. We start down on Coxon and then we do Duke of Gloucester and the Children's HDU and then we work our way up the slope to the spinal cord unit. So how do you find people's reactions are to when you bring the pets in? The ladies are generally more receptive than the gents. The ladies love it and they're normally fighting over each other to feed yeah. as many jammy dodgers as they can. <laughs> and she's quite partial to custard creams. Ah, too. is she? Me too! We have so much in common, me and Gracie. <laughs> uh, so what makes a dog good for this kind of thing? Can anyone... Sort of Any dog can do it as long as they're well-mannered. They can walk on a lead rather than a, a harness or... Um, a muzzle or, or a, Definitely not a muzzle, but some dogs use a head collar because they pull very hard. That's no good for this because they need to be able to be stroked and cuddled. Um, they they need to not be very gentle taking treats, not get worried if they hear a big noise around them, that sort of thing. Basically a level-headed, semi-comatose little dog like mine. <laughs> so how long have you had Gracie? We've had her um, just shy of two years now. Oh, right. She's a rescue dog. She's a retired racing greyhound. Oh. She did most of her racing. At Walthamstow. Oh, very interesting. I mean, she looks very tired, so she's still obviously relaxing post racing, post a life of racing. <laughs> she spends most of her time upside down on our sofa. <laughs> that sounds like a perfect existence. Throw in the custard creams, and you've got a perfect <laughs> afternoon. Uh, so, um, do you, have you been to the Buttercup Walk before? No, this is our first time. Oh, really? What do you think so far? It's great. It's lovely when the weather's like this. Absolutely. That really makes well, it. well, we decided we'd go and do Coxon and Duke of Gloucester Ward before we came over. Oh, lovely. So we've already done that this morning. So, so how was this morning? Fine. The wards, I mean, Coxon's almost empty. Mm. Um, and Duke of Gloucester was quite quiet as well, so it didn't take us very long this morning. Oh, well, Except my husband does take rather a long time. So, folks, <laughs> if you were in last week and you had Martin telling you all about Grace, I do apologise. <laughs> I'm trying to speed him up. <laughs> There's just so much to say. She's so gorgeous to be on, and she's so lovely, so well mannered and quiet. And yes, until you dangle a okay, jammy dodger in front of her face, <laughs> and then she's like a piranha. Ah, oh, right. Well, I've been there. She's, she's very good at r r rifling through the lockers now. <laughs> she knows which people have got biscuits in their lockers. She can she walk straight up to the locker to look for them. Straight up to the people that give her the biscuits. You're yeah. my favourite patient. Yeah. I remember Absolutely. 
<laughs> and the nurses all make a fuss of her too. Yeah, it sounds like she's got it sussed. Well, thank you so much for talking it's to us. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the afternoon yes, and the sunshine. We, yes, well, thank you very much. I have with me a familiar voice to Radio Brooklyn, Keith Reeve. Hello, Keith. Hello, Alan. And now, of course, you're here also in your other capacity with uh, your involvement with the Friends organisation. That's right. So, for anyone who's not familiar with the work that the Friends do, give us an overview of what, it, what the organisation does. OK, the Friends have been providing extra care and comfort to the patients, visitors and staff of this wonderful hospital since 1963. Uh, currently, we run a help desk in the outpatients department with entirely staffed by volunteers, and we also have a new shop in outpatients department, also staffed entirely by volunteers, and I say new, new shop opened last September when we moved out of our old shop and snack bar in the patient centre. This was around the time of the 50th anniversary, wasn't it? That's right. And I have to say, the shop looks absolutely brilliant. I mean, tell us about some of the uh, things that you sell in that shop. We can sell you anything you like within reason. We have some inflatable elephants, some elephant traps, harpoon guns, igloo <laughs> cutting kits, and some thermal survival outfits. But really seriously, we, we have headphones. If you have a like a, a, an iPod or something, you pull back to the hospital and you can't hear anything because you forgot your headphones, we'll sell you those, we'll sell you papers, we'll sell you sandwiches, we'll sell you bars of chocolate, we'll sell you a bar of soap, and we'll sell you all those other bits and pieces that you or your visitors might like. There's been a lot of changes going on in the Friends, I think it's fair to say, over the last sort of, six months to a year or so especially. I mean, tell us about some of the changes that have been happening. Well, I'm now the general manager of the Friends of the Hospital, um, which basically means I do the day-to-day -day admin and I'm the face of the Friends around the hospital in meetings and, and other events that take place. Um, we are just pledged some money to the, um, in fact, last year, the new Princess Eugenie House has been built on the grounds of the hospital this coming year. Um, so we've pledged £150,000 towards that project, which is fantastic. Um, part of that will be a new Graham Hill suite, which will go into that building, uh, because the Friends have a very long-running association with Graham Hill. Uh, back in 1979, a, a centre opened in his name here, and that is going to be polished, so we're continuing that association by funding a new suite in Princess Eugenie House. So how best can anyone listening support the Friends if they want to get involved or make a donation? How best can they get involved? Well, if you go to the r &H website and you search for Friends, you'll find our presence on there. It's all the information about what we do, how to donate, how to join us. Membership is £10 a year. Life membership is £150. Um, you can download um, or email the office rather, which would be me anyway, and I'll send you, either email you or post you a membership form, uh, or you can just pop into the hospital shop or the help desk and they will have that information there as well. Oh, well I found someone else uh, to talk to. We've got Russell here with us who um, uses the apples from the orchard here in the grounds of Stanmore to make his own apple juice. So what's your, um, how do you use the apples here? What, how did that all come about? Well, I was creating a community orchard across Harrow and finding places that have got apples that they weren't, weren't being used. I was told about the hospital. They've got a few apple trees. And you do more questions and you find out... We used to have five big orchards here as part of the... Wow, I didn't know that. Five well, big orchards. Orchard, yeah. Apple orchards. Yeah, well, yeah. And uh, the one here has got about 30-odd trees. And you can see where they've been. The old ones have died and gone away. But there's still 30-odd trees producing good fruit. But 2012 was a really poor year, the first year I came. And the, the apples looked really small and rough. And anyway, I, I got permission to harvest from the hospital and I made some cider. And it tasted all right. And then last year, apples were falling off trees all over the place. And I was overwhelmed here. But I got enough to produce a good, a good uh, lot of, a good, a uh, lot of bottles of apple juice, which, um, for, for those apples, you have to hand pick them. Make sure they don't touch the ground. Yeah. And so they're, they're all clean and fresh. Wow. They, and uh, I've been told today it's really nice apple juice, which is what oh, you like wonderful. to hear. Because it's challenging. When, you, when you're when picking the apples and you're not quite sure what the apple trees varieties are, yeah. you're not quite sure how it's going to taste. And then I was able to collect the fruit from the ground and press that, and that's been fermenting into apple juice, into cider. So you've got apple juice here today, which all the apple juice is made from the, the apples that you'll be on the orchard. Wonderful. What other bits and pieces have you made? Well, I've, I've been using apples to make other things, and depending on the quality and what other fruit I've, I've got, I've been making out, trying quince and apple jam, quince and apple wow. jelly. And on the health theme, I use my rose hips to make rose hip syrup, wow. which is very high in vitamin C. 
Oh, very that's healthy. good for when you're coming out of surgery and things like that. We well, need to put your levels and that, up again. Again, if in the autumn when the cold's coming round, if you don't want your flu jab, uh, a, sp a spoonful of rose hip syrup a day keeps the doctor away. Sort of. Wow. So um, when you when you sort of do you have you always made the apple juice or have you always been just someone that likes making things out of fruit? How did this all sort of start for you? Well, it started when I was walking around here and seeing all these apples on the ground. Thought we ought to be able to do something with that. Yeah. And so it started in a small way, and I, I organised an apple day in Harrow to get people interested. Oh, that's brilliant! And uh, when I heard about the Buttercup Walk, I thought, well, I ought to be promoting Stanmore Hospital's own apple juice at, at their big event of the year. And uh, we're now looking at working with the orchard, which has been neglected 15, 20 years, to prune the trees so they don't overgrow themselves, yeah. and they remain, they're, they're safe and they're easier to pick. And hopefully we'll get a better crop of apples each year. Wonderful. And if they're good this year, what? The sky's the limit. Apple well, juice. Well, not quite. Not quite. <laughs> but you know, we ought to be having um, apple pies here yeah. from, from apples direct from the. That would be perfect for a day like yeah, today yeah. of apple pies. Yeah. Good idea. Well, it was a I'm pleasure talking to you. Well, I'm sure someone who hopefully is listening to this will like to try making. Um, sort of apple ice cream or something oh, like lovely. that. They've We're, got some homemade ice cream over there, actually, yeah. haven't they? So maybe. Maybe next year. That's yeah. a great idea. Well, it was a pleasure Thank talking to you, Russell. Thank you for having me. Enjoy the rest of your day. And, and you. Thank you. Bye. Now, my name is Marge, uh, interviewing from uh, Radio Broccoli here at the Buttercup Walk. Now, I'm here with Guy, sorry, your name is? Stavros. Stavros. Yeah. Stavros from Stanmore Fire Station. That's correct, yeah. Um, now, I was asking Stavros a few questions, and we're looking at a very impressive fire engine here. Uh, and I was asking Stavros, how long have they got from the time they get a shout um, to get dressed or piling and get get to get to the scene what, what's your time scales our turnout time which means we got to be out of the station doors ideally within 60 seconds uh, 60 seconds that's very short yeah well in, in a fire situation mm -hmm. or in an RTA situation mm -hmm. every second counts so we have got to be ready to to perform basically so 60 seconds it is that's that's our target uh -huh. Okay, uh, so 60 seconds to get out and get into the fire engine. What about kitting out? How, how long did that take? Because obviously you have to be prepared when you arrive at the scene. Yeah, um, kitting out we call rigging, so we're expected to be rigged in our PPE, which is uh, personal protective equipment, boots and leggings, jacket and gloves within that 60 seconds. The only person that doesn't rig is the, the motor driver or the driver because they, they can't drive in their fire kit. As soon as they turn up at an incident, they'll change into their fire gear. Um, now, I was talking to you about how many um, uh, guys you have on a watch. Uh, I'm being sexist here, so, sorry. How many in your team for a watch? Right. Uh, our teams are called watches. Yeah. And as a generic term, guys, we don't, you know, we just yeah. call them guys. Oh, you do? Or oh, the okay. crew. So I did um, get it right. Yeah, yeah, you did. Um, a minimum of four and a maximum of six. We can't, there's six seats on the fire engine, so obviously we can't have anybody just standing around. Uh, we're supposed to wear our, our seat belts as well on, on route to an incident. And we can't, we can't be mobilized with less than four people on a, on a watch or a team for health and safety reasons. It's a minimum crew level that we ride. Minimum, okay, so a, a minimum for what happens then uh, if you get a shout and, and you, you can't make those numbers? Um, at the beginning of each shift, we, uh, we do a roll call and it's like a register for us and we're allocated our tasks for the day. That's when we'll know, or really before then, if, if everybody's turned up for work, if somebody's late or had an accident or been taken ill. And then accordingly, um, they'll send in a standby or if there isn't a standby, we inform control and they, they, there's a term uh, we use called taken off the run where we're not we're not operational until a standby comes from another station. Okay, that all sounds very good. You're also talking to me, you were mentioning colours uh, for various watches. Explain, tell, me, tell my listeners something about that. Yeah, we have four watches providing 24 hour cover. There's blue watch, green watch, red watch and white watch. Now uh, what, what, what do all those mean? Is, is, that, is there some sort of importance to those colours? No, it's just a way of differentiating nice primary colours. Um, okay. Green Watch, which is ourselves, we're on duty now. We start at half nine in the morning and we finish at eight. That's uh, the duration of a day shift. The night shift is from eight o'clock in the evening to half nine in the following morning. Those are long hours. 
those, those are very long hours. Now, I've, I've got to say, you, um, obviously, you know, for the work you do, you have to maintain a certain level of fitness. What, what, what sort of fitness levels? Is there a target fitness level? There, there are fitness levels and routine periodic medicals that we have to pass every three years and also during the day shift we're allocated about an hour to go and work out in the gym. Every fire station has a gym of some sorts where we can go and work out. Okay, and I must admit I didn't know that, that you fire. Okay, so on, on a lighter note, uh, what, what, what is the best thing about being a fireman, in your opinion of course? For me, personally, serving the community, um, people want us to respond when there's an incident. But, you know, we, we go to things like rescuing cats from behind kitchen units. It's, all, it's not all doom and gloom. Um, we provide a good service for people that, that require it. Um, lots of community events, school visits. It's, it's so varied. That's what attracts me to this job and what I like about it the most. No day is the same. Good. So that, that, that tells me that you're a people person. 100% yeah good very, very glad to hear it Stavros now thank you very much for the inf interview now I'll just ask one final thing uh, one tip if there's one tip that you could give to my listeners about fire safety what would it be um, the London Fire Brigade provides a, a free service we'll come round to a home fire safety visit give you some home fire safety advice and put up as many smoke alarms as, as are required for the property that you live in it's a free phone number it's 08000 28 I'll repeat that, 08000 28 I look at it as uh, proactive firefighting. That is very good and very useful uh, and uh, we will broadcast that number obviously to the listeners. Thank you very much, Dave. You're really welcome, thank, thank you. you. I've now got one of the fire engine, fire engine, fireman helmets on, and uh, I think it's fair to say it looks very dashing. And there's a, a front on it that comes down, and it was described to us as a Darth Vader-esque um, front to the the screen. And I'm going to pull it down just so you can hear it. There we go. You hear the click. And now I'm somewhat muffled, so I'm going to put it back up. Um, but it's not actually as heavy as I thought. I'm just going to hop in the fire engine as well and have a look around in there. Got a big pair of fire boots I can see at the bottom here and they look very and they've got the trousers attached to the fire boots so you're ready for action you know in Fireman Sam where you um, see them all jump down straight in the boots then the trousers come out of the boots that's real they don't make that up for the joy of Fireman Sam that's an accurate portrayal of the life of a fireman and there are braces on them this is great I probably can't try that on can I how far can we push this <laughs> um, and the rest of it kind of look they've got a funky screen on the front which probably tells them where they need to go to answer the fire calls Right, Stavros is just slipping into the fire boots I just talked about, and they look very sim- Wow! It's just instant! Instant fire engine! From nothing to fireman! PPE on in about 30 seconds. We have got a jacket as well, and a helmet, gloves, and that's our full rig for, uh, for any incidents. Oh, and a flash hood as well for going into fires. At a, at a car crash or somebody locked out or locked in, you wouldn't wear that necessarily, but yeah. Well, you look the part. It looks amazing. I love it. I like the idea of not having to think too much. Just jump in and you're ready to go. I think maybe I could adapt my wardrobe slightly into a similar thing. Maybe not necessarily fire resistant or retardant because I don't plan on being in any fires. But I like the thought of the quickness and yeah. you look very dashing. With your, with your slingbacks and your high heels, you put them on yeah, straight Yeah, perfect. Exactly what I need. Yeah, the tight's already ready. Just jump in. Thank you so much for talking to us again. We are uh, currently here at the Buttercup Walk at the Radio Broccoli Tent. Um, first of all, your name please. Oh, My name's Rachel, Rachel Levine. Um, yes. Good to meet you, Rachel. Now, Rachel was just telling me a story and actually thanking us. I'll, I'll let Rachel tell the story. <laughs> I'll say thank you, but it's a bit. It's about 40 years late. I was in... Um, I was in the Royal National Orthopaedic when I was eight years old and I was in Coxon Ward then and then again when I was 12, 13 and I was in Zachary Merton Ward and Radio Broccoli really kept us going. I was just asking Rachel if she could remember and I know we are going back way, way, way back in time, the first record she requested here at Radio Broccoli and that was we're going back to 1969. I can't remember. I can't remember the song then, but I remember that um, when I was a bit older, um, everyone was crazy about um, "River Deep Mountain High" by by Tina Turner, and um, uh, that song has always stuck in my mind ever since. It always takes me back here whenever I hear it. 
Well, I'm sure if we get a chance here at Radio Broccoli at some point in the day, we will play that song for you just to bring back the memories. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for coming over to us, Rachel, and I do hope you enjoy the day. I certainly am enjoying it, and thank you all so much for all you do, because it's amazing, and I don't think you actually realise how much you know benefit you are to all the patients here and staff as well. You know, It is very nice of you to say so, and be, that, even though it's 40 years late, we thank you very much for coming over to us. Thank you, Rachel, and enjoy your day. Thank you too. Bye. <laughs> Well, I am standing here on the side of the racetrack for the uh, Further Buttercup Walk. So, yes, yeah, so there's plenty of uh, people around. They're queuing just next to the start line. We've got air cadets and patients and babies and children and buggies. Um, and there's this, um, this, fire, this stand with um, a bowl on the top and some fire coming out, which um, obviously adds drama to the... Uh, to the race. I think Matt Whitlock is going to be uh, walking the walk um, himself and he's also going to be uh, opening it with uh, the lovely Alex McCartney who will chat to you as well. And I think what happens is, is they walk all the way down to the, uh, to the bottom of the hill and then they come back up. So, is everybody here? Looks that way. So we're going to ask Max and Alex if they wouldn't mind positioning themselves, ready to cut the tape. Five, four, three, two, one. Thunderbirds are go. Hey, off you go. Good luck, everybody. Let's have your name. Julio Diaz. I do know of your radio station, yet, and yes, I can quote, it is one of the longest running hospital radio stations going. We certainly are. Um, now, I'll probably get this wrong. Uh, what was it, 44 years? Yes, that's right. And yeah. I started coming here in the, in the 70s, late 70s. Um, so, what, what's your view of the hospital and, of course, the radio station? Um, radio Broccoli. Like I say, I listened to it for many years, um, spent a uh, considerable time here. Up to, up to nine months at the time, laying on my back in bed, hospital, not getting a suntan, actually in traction, leg lengthening. And um, regarding the hospital itself, it's a remarkable place. And um, I believe there's still only three in the country. Um, and I'll take my hat off to everyone that works here and does what they do. Yes, that, that, that is very nice of you. It's always nice to get some positive feedback. Um, now, you know, I am from Radio Broccoli, so l let's uh, do a bit of Radio Broccoli promotion. Can you remember, over, over the years, what has been your favourite song, that's re you've re your most requested record here at Radio Broccoli? Well, my taste, I like variety, so it's quite a mix, really. Um, but, uh, yeah, a bit of Coldplay now, and if they was playing, like, London's Calling to get the rhythm and people's feet moving, you know, uh, that would be really good. Um, sex on fire, we could have a bit of that today. Um, yeah. You're in one of those moods, aren't you? You know, <laughs> yes. Um, but I must say, as well as my name being Julio Diaz, I'm also known as Muddy Wheelchair J. Um, now, do, should I ask why? Remembering this is a family show. <laughs> oh yes, absolutely. I'm about getting people outdoors and giving them a quality of life. I take them, getting them out with their kids, their dogs, um, off road, through the parks, footpaths, etc. There's plenty of chairs that will take you around Tesco's all day, um, but I think beyond that, outside the box. Good, and that is very, very impressive. Now, I should say at this point, I am walking with Julio here on the Buttercup Walk. Uh, um, Julio is in a wheelchair, but as you can, as he has already said, he's all for getting outdoors uh, and getting involved. And very good for you, Julio. I'm here with uh, Michael, who is uh, alongside me doing the walk. And um, what's your connection with the RNOH, Michael? Uh, last last year, Mr. Cullen rebuilt my girlfriend's left foot, which had been. So severely damaged in an accident and it involved very complex surgery it took about four hours and she's got in a region of a dozen screws and a metal plate in the foot but has made a complete recovery and is now able to partake in events like this and recently did a 20 mile cycle challenge is this your first bus cut walk it is yes because jenny had the operation last august and how are you finding it so far not too bad, I just have to take it very steadily because I'm quite limited on my range. But I'll get there, I might have to rest in between, but I'll get there. 
Okay. Your, your name is? Mary Fanning. Nice to meet you, Mary. As Thank I said, I'm from, I'm from Radio Broccoli and I see you're doing the walk yes. with, your, with your crutches. Um, is this your first uh, buttercup walk? No, my third. Your third? Yes. Oh, and that, that's really... Last two years I've been on it as well. Okay, and how many, how many years have you been coming to the hospital? I came for a back brace maybe ten years ago. Uh -huh. So um, what, what makes you make the effort to come to do the buttercup walk every year for the last three years? Because I agree with the, uh, the theory of the hospital helping people and uh, enabling them to get around more easily. Um, and that is very much what the Buttercup Walk is all about. Yes. Um, and you can see actually it's been a, it's a beautiful day, the sun is shining and there are loads of people doing the walk. So very much the hospital's concept yes. uh, is being carried out, wouldn't you say? I know it is, yes. It's great to see. Um, right now, Mary, I'm going to leave you so that you can carry on. We're, Mary's just got through the first lap of the walk uh, and rapidly approaching shall we say rush rapidly approaching the finishing line yes that's <laughs> right i'm um, just at the halfway line and the halfway point is um the uh just at the top of the car park the main car park um and the halfway point greets you with some great uh great flowers great plastic flowers um and a big sign that says halfway and you're also met with some fantastic air condets um, it's actually right next to the Radio Broccoli studio and then once you've got there um, it's basically just building up as much stamina as possible to make sure um, that you can make the second half. I'm Radhika Harichandra and, and I'm Kriya. So oh that's, that's, that, that's so much easier. <laughs> 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 um, now, now you say this is your first buttercup walk? Yes. Mm, yes. Okay. It's Tell me why you're doing it. It's a thank you walk uh, for spinal injury unit. Okay, and you were telling me that your husband was here? Yeah, he was here eight years ago, but we have lifetime support with this SIU. Mm -hmm. They kept our lives going in a quality way. And I wanted to just say thank you for doing this work. Well, no, no, that, that is what it's all about. Yeah. A lot of people do, do the Buttercup Walk because they want to give something back. Exactly. Um, the event raises uh, money for the hospital. Yeah, I should thank people like Dr. Gall, Dr. Hamid, Liz Bambury and Sharon, they are, they are the urology specialists and we have a nightmare with my husband's care and they make it bearable and the nurses Louise and you know there's Jason who keeps giving me advice how to move forward. You know that all these people play a very key part in our lives. If not I think we would have been just a broken family and they kept us together. <laughs> Um, if you don't mind me asking, um, how did your husband have an accident? He had a road traffic accident oh, wow. and it was just che one Saturday we were fine, the next day, Sunday, he was in hospital, so life just changes. Life I, changes just like that. Yeah. And they made it bearable, sir. Now I've got to say, you, 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 you have given a very positive account of, oh. of the aftercare you've received. I have osteoarthritis and I'm walking. <laughs> <laughs> well that makes it even better. Yeah. Now, I, I know you probably won't, might not know the answer to this, um, but did your husband listen to Radio Broccoli during his time here? Yes, he did, he did. Because, um, you know, he was in sound engineering. Oh, really? And yeah, yeah, he really enjoyed it. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, sometimes he's down and he doesn't listen, but he has regularly listened that, to me. Men are like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it is good. Uh, it's nice. It's, it feels so good. Uh -huh. Now, you've been very quiet. Uh -huh. <laughs> but I'm not going to let you get away with that. <laughs> <laughs> now, just say your name again for me. Korea. Right, Korea. And now, now, what's your memory of that time? Because I would imagine you were much younger at yeah, that time. So and I, how did it affect you? I mean, it was it was great because I would be allowed to come in, and they'd find me a little corner where I could sit and do my homework because I'd come after school. And um, they were all very friendly, really nice, and they all remember me and are really welcoming when I come back. So I feel very much a part of it as well, even though Mum is um, my dad's primary carer. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
Um, well, that, that is really good to go. And the one thing I have to say I've noticed at the hospital is that the staff here are very, very accommodating. Well, not, not just to pay the older patients, but also children. Oh, yeah. At the time. No, they've been, they were really great. And they didn't mind me kind of roaming the ward and going and saying hi to younger patients and just kind of trying to hang out with people of my own age. Uh -huh. Um, they almost encouraged it, which is really nice. That that is very good, and again, another positive account of of, uh, <laughs> uh, of a patient stay uh, in the hospital. Ladies, thank you very much. So um, we're just in the second half of the walk, and um, I'm here with some three lovely ladies who are um, walking up to the top of the hill. What's your name? Imogen. And what's your connection with the RNOH? I'm having an operation here in August. Okay. Um, and um, your is this your first bus cut walk? Yeah. Um, so, do you think next year after you've had your operation you're going to be uh, doing the walk again? Hopefully, yeah. Whereabouts is your operation? On my back, goliosis operation. So you'll be admitted in August? Yeah. Um, and then have they explained to you anything about the treatment during it or...? Yeah. Yeah, they've been really helpful. What's your name? Megan. Nice to meet you, Megan. What's your reason for doing the walk? I can see, I should say of course that Megan is doing the walk on crutches, <laughs> in the hot sunshine, uh, just coming up to the uh, finishing line, uh, you've done very well, Megan. Okay, so um, w what's your reason for doing the walk today? Uh, to raise money and for my friend Carly, who was treated here. How, do you know how long ago? Uh, I'm not sure. Okay, but that, that, that is very, very nice of you. Is, is Carly on crutches as well? No, not anymore. Okay, um, now I see you're, you're on crutches yourself. Do you know when you're hoping to lose the crutches? Uh, hopefully very soon. Hopefully very soon. Now, uh, Megan is doing very, very well. The finishing line is in sight. Uh, and guess what? Megan's speeding up a little bit. Well done, Megan. Thanks. <laughs> now, look, I'm walking with Megan up to the finishing line. Five, four, three, two, one. Excellent. Excellent. Well done, Megan. And, uh, and there was a burst of speed there from Megan. How do you feel? You've completed it. You're looking very tired, but you did it. How do you feel? Brilliant. <laughs> she did very, very well. Mum and Dad, have you got anything to say? I only hope it raises a lot of money for a good hospital. It is, and that's been the feedback we've been getting. Yes. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thanks to both. Thanks to all of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Right now, uh, hello. Hello. Uh, can I have your name? My name is Vivian Cripps. Okay. And Vivian, you were telling me that um, you, 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 you've, had, you've seen this hospital from both sides, as a patient and as a nurse. Yeah, as I, I was born with a, a club foot and I had the great, um, for, great good fortune of being a patient of Mr. Fripp who operated my foot when a lot of people had told my mother there was no way she would ever walk and walk properly or walk at all and Mr. Fripp agreed to operate. I, came, I saw him at the Royal National Hospital in, in um, London and then I came here as a patient. I was on Sir William Coxon Ward, many, many admissions and then unfortunately we had a car accident when I was 11 so I was then readmitted because they, they messed up at the uh, another hospital and I uh, was on Lina Williams Ward which was teenage girls ward and next to Sir Cur um, Colonel Ward Ward who were teenage boys so you can imagine it was great fun and I was a patient for six months. For six months? Now I've got to say some of the wards that you have mentioned uh, no longer exist do they? That's Although right. Although Coxon is still they're, going. They're, yes they don't they exist in the building but they're not used they're for not the same uh, reasons are they? They're not teenage boys and yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay now obviously during that time something must have happened uh, because you went into you you also went into the medical profession I did I think it probably my aunt gave me a nurse's uniform at the age of six but I had been a patient before that I was so touched by the care the, the love and the kindness I got here and actually probably did make me want to be a nurse and Mr. Fripp the day I arrived in 1964 to be a nurse I was walking up towards Brockley Hill House towards Brockley House main building and Mr. Fritt was coming down with his entourage of uh, nurses, doctors and physios and he had told me, my mother that I shouldn't be a nurse because it would be too much for me but actually I just you know absolutely went for it and he was retiring that day so it was so nice to actually you know say hello and goodbye and thank him again and I was here till 1967 
Now, is, is that an absolutely lovely story? Now, um, we, you, uh, during your nursing time here, which, which wards did you work on? I worked on, my first ward was on the slope, Ward 7, and it was a men's ward, and I was there, and I was shocked because I didn't know anything about men. 17 years of age, and I, oh my goodness, a bed bath, oh, I was frightened to death. But uh, the sister Jarrell was wonderful, and um, I've got into the way of it. The men were really full of beans, most of them RTAs, you know, fractures, and actually they they were jo a jolly bunch even though they were recouping. Then I was on A&E, um, I was on um, Ward 1, I was on Lina Williams, William Coxon Ward. Oh, so and you went back to nurse yes, on the ward where yeah, it all started? Yes, so yeah, I went yeah. I, and I... I was on the isolation ward, which might have been Ward 9 right at the top. Angus McKinnon, I believe. Yes, that's it? right, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, theatres, plaster theatre. Uh -huh. We didn't do theatre, but we did go into theatre. But all I can say is that this is like my second home. I love it so much. OK, now you, you've had many, many years here at the Royal National Orthopaedic yes. Hospital. Um, and actually, it's quite a, 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 a good story because it, although over, it's a one of triumph really, because even, even though your 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 medical team was saying, well, you can't do that, yeah. you're clearly a lady that once you've made your mind up, yeah. you'll go. Absolutely, free. and I really would I would have never regretted anything. I've never regretted being born with a club foot. Without that, I wouldn't have been here. And I went on to the Hammersmith to do my general training in London, which was obviously a different, next one was Scrubs Prison, totally different. And I must admit, although it was a good training, nobody would ever beat the Royal National Orthopaedic for me. And I a think that's a brilliant place. story. Now, I really can't let you go without you mentioning Radio Broccoli. Um, Radio Broccoli, fantastic. I think it was actually set up. I think I was here as a nurse when it was set up. 1966, so you yes, should have been. I was. I left in 67, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so actually, yeah. and we were all thrilled to bits and very excited. And well done, you guys, because it's great fun when you're a patient. And a lot of people are here a long time, aren't they? That's Scoliosis, true. So fractures, true. Yeah, you know. Yeah, that is so true. Hello, I'm sitting here with uh, Trina and Maggie. They've been deserted by Colette, who was here moments ago. But I think she's just run off for a second, so she should be back soon. Uh, we have one nurse, Trina, from Ward 4, and a uh, ward clerk from Clark, Clark, is it either way, <laughs> from Ward 4. Um, how, how full is Ward 4 at the minute? We, we never have an empty bed. Really? So we could do with an extension. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Is Ward 4 one of the full. really yeah. big ones? So what kind of uh, ward is Ward 4? So, so we're elective spinal surgery, so we take spinal deformity and sort of um, sarcomas, so tumours of the spine, with its cord compressions, we take those patients as well. And you mentioned something about a garden, uh, gardening earlier, do you want to tell me about that? Yeah, we have um, a small patio area um, for patients to go out and sit, which is really important for them. I mean, only this week a lady actually came up to me that she's been in hospital for six weeks and she said you know she um she said it was just wonderful to have somewhere that she could walk out in the mornings and just sit outside so we originally started it because um sadly we lost two of our staff nurses passed away a few years ago so that's how we started um fundraising and get we've had sort of memorial benches and that and it's oh, sort of grown lovely. from there so um, you know, it's, it's an area where the patients can actually get away from the ward for a little bit and sit outside in the sun and that, so... <laughs> it's lots great. of different things like therapy is kind of, it just helps to get over the, when you've had a major operation yes. or something, it really helps have something to distract you, I think, and we've had it a lot does, of people yeah. from different charities saying that today, that yeah. uh, we've had the, the pets as therapy oh, yes, and things like yeah. that, so it's kind of back to normality a little bit I suppose is, for people yes. when they can enjoy gardening or enjoy just sitting in yeah, a garden yeah, because they do help I mean I know that they sort of water sometimes for me and and do you know deadhead plants and that so it, it's just nice so that they've got somewhere to go you know to get away from the ward for a bit are you a keen gardener or did you have to learn before it's sort of you know grew, it's grown if you like the like plant. garden <laughs> Um, I just, you know, I just sort of keep it ticking over, really. So, yeah. um, but no, it's something I've got more and more interested in over the last few years. <laughs> We've got Colette back now. She has come back. <laughs> she, you are also a nurse, aren't you? That's right. She doesn't look very impressed that I've called upon her to speak. Are you enjoying the day today? Lovely day. Could be a bit cooler. <laughs> yeah. Is, is, we don't want to say it's too warm because we don't want to scare the weather, whoever decides on this. Uh, but it's lovely today. Did you all do the walk? 
no, we did the bottle store, so ah. obviously we raised money for our ward. Right, wonderful. Uh, do you always come every year? Yeah. Uh, four years running, I think now. Four yeah. years running. So we always do. We do. We started off doing cakes the first year, which was really popular, and then we moved on to the bottle tombola, which is even more popular. <laughs> so we just have a mixture of you know different types of bottles, all donations coming in. Um, and so, you know we've, we've done quite well today and it just helps with the upkeep of the garden that's what yeah it's definitely yeah yeah so it'll last us a year now to replace things and, and keep the upkeep of the garden that's such a good idea and it really it makes such a difference to oh, patients yeah, to have yeah. that because I suppose it also makes them feel like you guys are their friends because you're yeah. giving them something that's a bit of extra on top of the amazing care oh. you already give them, you know, something extra. And patients on the ward at the moment, they actually donated bottles, so they've actually helped as well with the oh, upkeep really? of the garden yeah. because they've made big donations. I suppose if you see how helpful it is, you just want to pass that on to people if you've been in the ward for a while. Is it a ward where people have to stay for quite a long time, generally, ward for? Um, or is it, 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 I mean, it can be sort of from five days, but they could be in for sort of two, three weeks, some, unfortunately, a bit longer. Yeah. yeah. Well, I hope you continue to enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. It was lovely talking to you and continue you the amazing well. work. I mean, in the ward and with the garden. That sounds beautiful. Oh, thank you very much. Hello to all our ladies and gents on Ward for listening. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. You shout out if you'd like to. We love you. <laughs> okay, enjoy thank the rest you. of your day. Thank you Lovely. so much. Thanks, thank you, guys. Thank you. I'm now here with Max Whitlock, the double Olympic bronze medalist and three times European champion gold medalist for gymnastics. Uh, you've just done the buttercup walk, yeah. <laughs> probably the feat of your athletic career, I think you'd probably agree. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, just, it's great to be a part of this event, you know, the buttercup walk is, uh, obviously means a lot, to, a lot to many people and uh, it's great to be a part of it and supporting a great cause. Yeah, so um, congratulations on winning a third gold medal at the European Championships last month. Thank you. So how was it? It was really good, you know, the whole European experience for us, not just me, you know, the whole team, we've done amazing out there and uh, to come back with the medals we got was, was really good. So you, do you, and you just got back from Portugal yesterday. Yeah. So yeah. full on, completely yeah. full on. Yeah, it's been quite busy. I was uh, out in Portugal for a recovery camp, so it was quite nice to get away and uh, have a chilled bit of time there. And uh, be straight back into training when I get back and uh, ready for the Commonwealth Games. Hopefully, that's coming up. So, what does your training involve? What do you? What's a standard? Do you train like? I don't even know. Why do you begin with the questions about training? I, uh, well, I train six days a week. I get Sundays off, and uh, it's about 35 hours a week. So it's a full-time job for me, basically. Wow. Um, it's a lot of hard work, but you know these results uh, it just makes it all worthwhile. So do you? Are you generally on? Like, like we saw on? Is it called a bot? The the pump horse. The yeah. pump. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> sorry. So is that the main thing? What's your favourite apparatus? Like, is that? The pommel was my favourite apparatus as well. Um, it's uh, I've, I've liked it for since I was a very young age, um, and uh, you know I've done gymnastics for a long time now, and I've, you know I, I just really love the sport. So when did you start? I started when I was seven years old. I'm 21 now. So how did you get into it in the first place? Um, well, I was I was in, involved in swimming, and a friend there just introduced me into it and uh, said try it out, and I've and I've loved it ever since. And then you overtook them, and they thought, no, <laughs> I was the best at gymnastics. <laughs> <laughs> now Max has overtaken me. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, what kind of uh, is your training program like at the minute? If you're gearing um, up to Commonwealth Games and everything later. Yeah, at the moment we've got a couple of weeks now where I'm I'm in the gym trying to learn a few new skills and stuff. So, um, but in a couple of weeks, you know, me and my coach Scott will be discussing our plans and our aims, and uh, you know, getting into the build-up for the Commonwealth Games, and that's when I'll be trying to get my routines as ready as I can and perfected for the in time for the competition. So what's your, your favourite event that you've done so before then? What's your sort of your moment of that was the best I, by, for me? By a mile uh, Olympic Games yeah. and, and, uh, yeah, you know, in front of a whole cr home crowd and uh, you know support was amazing there and uh, to compete uh, at home Olympics is, is definitely a once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah, definitely. Completely amazing. And all of the, just everything around it, the support level was just yeah. incredible, wasn't it? Yeah, it really was. It the really was. The whole country kind of got behind. Yeah, and we really felt that as athletes going in there and, uh, you know, support on Twitter and social media and everything like that was amazing. And support for my family was, you know, it was amazing. So are you feeling confident for the Commonwealth Games, you and your team? Yeah, yeah, it'll be a tough competition. We've got the Scottish boys, they're probably our hardest competition out there. and. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, you know, I try and look at every competition the same and go into it and uh, enjoy the experience. Definitely, yeah. So, um, what other events have you got coming up for the rest of the year? For the rest of the year, uh, this year is quite 
uh, unique year. We've got three majors this year, so the World Championships is coming up at the end of the year. Um, so it's great to have three majors with the Europeans, Commonwealth and Worlds, so it's hopefully a busy year. Definitely. Um, so looking ahead to Rio 2016, do you know if you'll be taking part? I hope so. That's been the main aim for a long time now. Yeah. You know, straight the day after London 2012, you know, my aim was focused on Rio. And uh, every day I'm in a gym, I'm focusing on what I want uh, to be in time for, uh, for Rio, and that's, the, that's my main target, yeah. Such a long goal to have, and then it comes yeah. by so fast, doesn't yeah, it? You exactly. kind of think, I'm working towards this thing, and yeah. I always feel with big sporting events like that, not that I am in an Olympic team, even slightly, <laughs> but you kind of, you think it's so far away, and it just creeps yeah. up on you, and I suppose it's even more the case when you're training towards something like yeah, that. Yeah, definitely. You know, I can't believe London 2012 was two years ago. It's gone so fast, and uh, Commerce is coming up quick again, and I'm sure... I'm sure 2016 Rio will come around quick, so we, everyone's just got to make sure they're ready. Because after 2012 with the Olympics, you would have had afterwards just such a huge uh, sort of, I guess, press obligation, and also all the events you have to take afterwards and maintaining training. Yeah. So the event is lo so much longer than just the actual Olympics itself. Yeah, it is. Uh, it was a bit crazy after Olympics. I got to do some opportunities where I maybe wouldn't have had the chance to do some cool stuff. And uh, but you know, I. As an athlete, you've got to get straight back into the gym, and that's what, I, that's what I've basically done. I think I had maybe only three weeks off, and then I was straight back in uh, really? for the next competitions coming up. Yeah. Crazy, it just never stops. Yeah, I guess exactly. you've just got, always got to keep yourself at that kind of level. You have, and uh, the longer you have off, the longer it takes to get back into it, so that's why I wanted to get into it and uh, focus on the competitions I had the year after. Yeah. So, um, how, how, you, how did you come to be involved in the event here today? Um, I'm a good friend of... Uh, a patient that uh, was here was treated here and uh, his name's David Holmes you know, he supports me and he's a good friend of mine and um, you know it's great to be invited to an event like this uh, to, to see all the people you know these are inspirational people and uh, it's great they're doing it for such a great cause great it was wonderful talking to you an absolute you. pleasure to meet you thank you very much and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and the sunshine because yeah. it's absolutely beautiful today yeah. thank you for having me on I'm here at the Muscat Walk um, live, and um, I'm also here with uh, Alex McCartney. Hi, Alex. Hello. Hello. You've got a fantastic story for us. Yes, I um, have. And I think everyone's trying to, we've got Stanmore College trying to video you, and we're trying yeah. to interview you. So um, we've got a bit of a celeb round here. Um, yeah. Do you mind me asking how old you are? I'm 10. You're 10 years old, and you've raised a hell of a lot of money. £7,000. £7,000. Okay, let's start at the beginning. Um, so you... Had to have a stay at the RNOH. Uh -huh. um, why Why was that then? Well, about a year ago, in May, um, I was playing um, handball in the playground with my friends and I got knocked on the shoulder and I came home to see this big bump on my shoulder. So he went up to the hospital and he had an x-ray and just like a big bobbly bit sticking out. And then we had, um, then we just kept on having MRIs and biopsies. So I had a biopsy, my first biopsy was last year, about this time of year, then I had one at Christmas, and then in January we um, went for a checkup, and they said that I had an osteosarcoma. Okay, and um, what does that mean? It means it's a bone tumour, so... Okay, so they had to operate on that? Yes. That was in February? February the 11th, yeah, so... Okay, um, that was this year, and how yeah. long did you have to stay in hospital for? It's only six days, so not that long. Okay, and that went all right? Yeah, it's fine. It's actually really nice. Yeah. And um, how's your arm feeling now? It's getting better, yeah. It's just a long road to recovery and physio and stuff. And you have to go back for checkups and things? Yeah, about I every few months. Okay, and um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, the fundraising side of it, because um, what's made you uh, such a special person around here, even more so than you already are, obviously? Uh -huh. Um, is the ridiculous amount of money you've managed to raise. Um, you said it was £7,000. Yes. How did you get to do that? Well, my mum, well, when we were at the hospital, we saw the advertisement for it and we decided to sign up for it. And then my mum cheekily started it on the payday of her work when everyone got their bonuses. So, <laughs> so in only a few hours, we reached our target of £500. Wow. So, yeah, and then it just gradually went from there, loads of people. And then people that you haven't met or seen or for like ages just started donating. So you got loads of family and friends on yeah. board. You got um, lots of members of the public who knew yes. about your story and found out through um, all sorts yeah. of press things. Uh -huh. Yeah, and um, so, so what is the target? Did you have to set a new target because you exceeded it within about five minutes? 
No, I don't know. <laughs> we just kept it as 500 because we didn't know okay. how far it was going to go. So now so. you've more than quadrupled the target. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a surprise, isn't it? Because we're like thinking we should go for 50, 100, and like a good 500. But then like, you think we'll get that? And then it went <laughs> 7,000. So Amazing. And um, are you looking to raise some more or is that it for now? Well, um, after today, it goes on for two weeks on the um, Just Giving page, so okay. hopefully more people donate. And um, what about the Buttercup Water today? Have you had some fun? Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, what nice weather stuff for did you do? Well, I did the penalty shootout over there. How did you do? Um, I beat the goalkeeper. <laughs> so. Amazing. Yeah. And um, you've got your mum here and yes. um, your sister? Yes, and my dad. So and your dad, cool. So it's a family outing? Yes. And do you live nearby? Uh, we, we live in South West London, okay. Putney, so it's not too far. Okay, great. Well, uh, thanks so much for having a chat with me. Thank you. And um, I hope you continue to enjoy the day. I'm with Peter Calder, who's the um, chairman of the RNOH Buttercup Walk. Good afternoon, Peter. Yeah, hello, how are you doing? I'm very well. Now, I have to say, I think we collectively must be all elated that today we've had such a gorgeous day for this event. I, I, when my alarm went off at five o'clock this morning and there was sun streaming in, I was absolutely delighted. Because yeah. the last three years have been a bit of a washout, so yeah. it was quite nice to go back how I remember it when I first arrived at Stanmore 10 years ago. So, yeah, it's been wonderful. Fantastic. So this is the, this is the 12th, I think, Buttercup yeah. Walk. We've had some great characters here in the way of celebrities and, yeah. and, and entertainment this year. And the people have responded. We seem to have more people here this year than we've had previously. Well, I mean... I agree. I think the weather's obviously important, but ob obviously getting uh, Max Whitlock, who has just been absolutely phenomenal. I mean, you know, the guy's the European gold medalist. He was bronze in the Olympics, mm -hmm. and he's one of the most humble people I've ever met in my life. He's so inspirational, yeah. and, you know, it's just brilliant. So he's just done his second presentation, and he's just got hundreds of kids just around him having their photographs taken. So that, that's a special moment as well. I think that's great. great. That's great. Do, do, what um, figure do you think we might be raising today? Right. Well, I've just been told that we've we definitely raised at least twenty-one thousand pounds so far, but that's without counting any of the donations that have come from the registration form today and uh, any, obviously, of the, the money raised in the rides and things like that. So I don't know. I mean. As we've always discussed, there is a bit of a struggle between the hospital charity for the redevelopment and the Buttercup Walk, which is just for the patients, and there is a special fund, and it goes from there. And then obviously, we've got League of Friends and various other organisations are all trying to raise money, and it, yep. you know, maybe. Uh, we need to re-debate exactly what we're raising money for and whether it's part of a big thing. But I still think that the, the patient, it's the patient's day, so yeah. I mean, I think we probably will stick with what we've got. I mean, as you know, last year uh, we, we've got new x-ray chairs. In fact, the, the last year's monies, we bought a new hot plate for the paediatric ward, so they've got a different set of food stuff that they can have now you know I mean that costs quite a few thousand pounds so you know I think it's important and then but the other thing we've got to do is make sure that everybody in the hospital is aware that this money exists yes so that we can and you know again you know but you know, small steps and we'll get yeah there. no it's, it's great I mean today has been great I've, I think I've seen I may be wrong more ex patients or even current patients yeah. here today yeah. than I've noticed in some years gone by yeah yeah, and again, it's it's all about the marketing, and I think that this was a thing that we you know, you know, you've been on the committee. You know, we've got a great bunch of people who really try hard, and we have open debate, and people come back and say, well, this hasn't worked, this hasn't worked. Mm. Last year there was a big thing that people said they didn't know about it. This we've tried to put that right this year, and yeah, I agree. We've got lots of patients coming because it is their hospital at the end of the yeah. day. Um, but we've just got some excellent people who still keep working hard. I think, again, we need to increase that family. I think we need to get more and more people involved yep. just, to, just to make it work easier. You yeah. know? But, I mean, you know, the people I'd really like to mention there, uh, Rosie Stoswalski and, and, and Vicky, who, you know, in, who've really worked hard for this, and I think it's a complete success. And I've just said to them, you know, I don't know how they're going to top it next year. Well, it's a challenge, isn't it? It is always a challenge. Thank you, Peter. That's Good right. luck. I hope it all does come out with more and more money. And yeah, exactly. it's all, as you say, it's all going to a good cause to help the patients, and they are number one. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Take care. Bye-bye.
Well, I'm here now with Tony Goldstone, who's the chairman of the RNOH. Tony, you must be very, very pleased with the way things have gone today. Yeah, it's, uh, the weather, fortunately, has been extremely kind to us. This is the, uh, the fourth one I've been to, and I think the last two or three years the weather's not been good. There's enormously good turnout today. You can tell, actually, particularly from the pressure on the catering, where they're running out of stuff which is not good but on the other hand it is good because it means more people have come than we expected so it's a great turnout. Fantastic, uh, obviously lots of news still about the redevelopment, I mean give us a little bit of an overview on the update or where we're at with that. Well at the moment those of you who've been in the hospital three or four weeks know that about three weeks ago we were descended upon by 40 people to do an inspection representing the new Her Majesty's Inspector of Hospitals, which is a new system which has come out of the problems of mid-staffs two years ago. And we are the first specialist hospital to be looked at. So we are expecting to hear in the next couple of weeks uh, what they thought. And it's absolutely of critical importance to the future of the hospital. If we get uh, a kind of good report from them, I think the issues of the redevelopment will accelerate because that's a kind of stamp of approval. If we don't, we're, you know, we'll possibly have difficulties again, but we're optimistic. The, uh, as far as the rebuild goes, it seems uh, pretty clear now that for most hospitals this system called the PFI really doesn't work very well and leaves the hospital with an enormous burden of annual payments for 30 years after. We're working uh, on another simpler system which is only given to hospitals which are doing well anyway. Every indication apart from that inspector's report is that we've had a good year. Seven or eight percent more work with the same number of staff all put through the same system safely and of a high quality. So we're optimistically looking towards a good report from these inspectors and to be able to move forward quickly in the autumn and in the new year before the election with a simpler form of loan to rebuild the hospital. And of course you've had support from Princess Eugenia who is here at the hospital recently to do the grand opening. Tell us a bit more about that as well. Yes, of course, again, those of you who know the hospital know that she had surgery here herself some years ago, a difficult back operation which went extraordinarily well. She's become uh, a pretty dedicated patron and she was here a few weeks ago for the development of the new children's high dependency unit. One of the things we review constantly here is, because we're kind of out in the country, is whether children's care in particular is absolutely 110% safe and this new children's high dependency unit will actually contribute to it staying as safe as we we know it is so we we're very delighted to see her and we uh, are hoping to see her in another three weeks at a, a big charity dinner for the hospital at the Savoy Hotel in London where again I hope we uh, raise a very considerable amount of money for the family and uh, children's accommodation. So yeah, it was a pleasure to see her there. She's uh, got quite close to Rosie and a lot of the staff and uh, we look forward to working with her and her family much more closely, repeatedly really. And finally, tell us about, uh, you know, obviously how important today is in terms of raising money for the new hospital and, and going forward, um, how are we doing with the whole fundraising? Uh, I think the fundraising is going well. It's not, and it hasn't been an ideal economic climate in the last two or three years, but that's improving now. What we have here is the enormous commitment of associated families who've had uh, major things done at the hospital to themselves or to their children and of course the, uh, the Buttercup Walk is not only a major uh, event for sponsoring but what it, repre it represents an enormous emotional thing for those who are immobile or disabled to to make this walk themselves and the, for their families to see them doing it with all the emotion attached to it 
some of them for, uh, having their recovery facilitated uh, by the rehab and the prosthetics here, some of them having their rehab facilitated by the surgery. So it's a, it's a fun day, it's a sunny day, it's a committed day, but it's an emotional day as well. It is indeed. Thank you very much, Tony, for speaking to us. It's a pleasure. Keep asking me back. <laughs> we ne will. Next time to talk about Manchester City winning the Premier League yet again. Oh, no, we'll gloss over that one. Thank you. <laughs> Big thanks to uh, Tony Goldstone for speaking to us then. Don't forget you can catch up with that and other previous editions of Broccoli News and Broccoli News Extra by logging on to our YouTube channel. And you can also catch Broccoli News Extra on Radio Broccoli Mondays to Friday lunchtimes at midday and Monday evenings at 8 o'clock. Plus, you can tune in to Broccoli News every Sunday at 8 o'clock for half an hour before bedside bingo. From me, Alan Joyce, so goodbye. <laughs>